Hi, and welcome to another episode of MD Insight. I'm delighted today to have with me Dr. Carol Burke. Carol is Vice Chair of Gastroenterology in the Department of uh, Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition at Cleveland Clinic, but she also directs uh, our polyposis and colon cancer center and has a particular interest in screening, colonoscopy and preventing cancer in patients. So maybe, Carol, you'd kick off by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you picked this field to get into. Oh, sure. Um, actually, I was interested in orthopedic surgery and pediatric surgery as a medical student at Ohio State. And then through a mentor that I had in a transitional program at a community hospital when I was an internal medicine resident, he turned me on to gastroenterology. And um, I love the field because of the procedural aspect as well as the um, mental aspect of the field. So through mentorship, I fell into gastroenterology. Well, well we might come back to mentorship later on, but that's quite a change. <laughs> Orthopedics to GI. So maybe talk a little bit about the, the Center for Polyposis and trying to prevent colon cancer, uh, about some of the people that are around you and the team that's there and, and the different services that we, we bring to bear to help these patients. Sure. Um, I've been at the Cleveland Clinic since my fellowship in 1991, and the reason that attracted me to stay on at the clinic as one of the staff members um, included the opportunity to care for patients with a predisposition to colorectal cancer and polyps, um, but also that the Cleveland Clinic has the world's largest inherited colorectal cancer registry. And it was through the teamwork of the registrars, the colorectal surgeons, geneticists, pathologists, and other subspecialists that we're able to create a team to care for families now moving on to caring for the fourth generation of some of our patients with hereditary colorectal cancer. And through that opportunity with the registry, um, I've been involved in national and international committees involved in understanding the genetics of hereditary colorectal cancer and on the leading edge of research to prevent um, colon polyps and cancer in these devastating diseases. Yeah, so we've got a team of physicians and endoscopists, but also genetics and things like that, so we can complement family histories and give the right advice to patients for the future. Absolutely, and we also have a lot of community outreach. So we know that there's underserved population uh, around the city of Cleveland, Northeastern Ohio. So I also work with Tossing Cancer Center in community outreach, providing um, fecal immunochemical testing to the underserved, uh, creating opportunities for them to come in for colonoscopies, um, and thinking about what the next role is for colorectal cancer screening in young individuals where colorectal cancer is increasing year over year in the, in the individuals under the age of 50. So I was going to ask you later, but bringing it up now then, what, what are the guidelines for people who might watch this and wonder when do they need a scope done? And obviously there have been recent changes in recommendations or at least discussion of that. So what, what's the right answer for most people? Well, the right answer is that everybody needs a colonoscopy at the age of 50 or older if they have no risk factors. But the American Cancer Society looked at the data, the change in both colon and rectal cancer that's increasing and has made a qualified recommendation. Um, so not a lot of strong data to support it, but modeling studies suggest that individuals at the age of 45 should start some type of colorectal cancer screening. The American College of Gastroenterology has come out with guidelines. I'm on there, I'll be writing the second set of guidelines for them. I was an, an author on the last set. Um, and the multi-society task force have come out for years and said, African Americans, because of their increased risk of colorectal cancer and increased risk of dying, even adjusted for stage, should start at the age of 45. But now it's suggested that young individuals under the age of 50, if they have any symptoms, they shouldn't dismiss rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits or abdominal pain. But the strength of the data to suggest starting screening at the age of 45 is based on modeling studies but we would encourage any young person to start early and most importantly to know their family history to see if they should start even earlier than that. Okay, super important advice. So you've been doing this now for more than two decades. So obviously there's been a lot of change and colorectal cancer is one of the cancers we know most about the genetics in the field. What are some of the most impactful changes that, that come to mind that you've seen over the last two decades? Uh, I think that um, some impactful changes relate to the use of chemotherapy. So now there's immune checkpoint inhibitors, so a whole new type of therapy, which is specifically important for individuals that have Lynch syndrome because their tumors develop through a different pathway than most of the sporadic cancers in this country. 
We've also learned a lot about polyps and enhancing the quality of colonoscopy to decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. And in 2005, we finally figured out that 20% of colorectal cancers in the United States don't develop from adenomas. They develop from sessile serrated polyps. So learning how to, to recognize those endoscopically, the understanding of how to remove those effectively, and then how to understand people at risk of colorectal cancer. And these days it's recommended that anyone with colorectal cancer, regardless of age, should have their tumor tested to look to see if they have a molecular fingerprint within the tumor that suggests a hereditary cause of cancer. And we know that 16, up to 16% of individuals that have a colorectal cancer will have a heritable defect that can be passed on to children and can affect other organs, and we need to watch those patients and their families very carefully. Yeah, absolutely, and so that's become standard of care here. Obviously, yeah. we test everybody. We do. So, so you've accomplished so much in an illustrious career. You're a recent uh, past president of the American College of Gastroenterology, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that and your experience with that. Um, yes, I, I have been so lucky to be honored by my peers, um, Quite frankly, when you end up in places you never uh, expect, I think it's all because um, I, I feel like our job is to serve other people and through service you reap double fold um, in return. So I was, I've been on the board of the American College of Gastroenterology for about 15 years, um, finished my presidency, I uh, had a few initiatives including understanding burnout, um, learning more about the ABIM and maintenance of certification which is going to a point of contention for a lot of our members, but I also had the opportunity to be the president of the Collaborative Group of the Americas on Inherited Colon Cancer, which my partner, James Church, started the organization many years ago. Um, and so I've just been so lucky to, um, to be in an environment that's allowed me to thrive, do research, take good care of patients, and then serve my peers at a national level. That's very gracious of you, but I think we've been the ones who've been lucky for, from the rewards of having you as part of the team. But I know you've got a great interest moving forward in um, maybe paying it forward to the next generation or helping the next generation, and that you've got a lot of interest in mentorship. So briefly and finally, what are your thoughts about that, and how do we do that best in medicine moving forward? Um, I think that mentorship is one of the, the reasons that we're all in medicine. Um, and I'm pleased to know that I've actually set legacy and I've had medical students at our, at our medical school that I've fostered their research career and they've become associate, assistant, and now professors in their departments. I think providing the opportunity for young people to work side by side with you, engaging them in research, there's always a small research project, it could be a case report, and then just providing support, coaching, and mentorship whenever you have an opportunity. Through the societies, they have mentorship programs, but I was also an uh, advanced peer coach here at the Cleveland Clinic. So I had the opportunity to work with not only trainees, but other staff members in order, them to, in order for them to understand their career and you know, move forward um, for success both in their personal and professional life. That's an amazing amount that you've accomplished. So thanks for spending a little time with me today and really appreciate your insight and your feedback. Thanks, Connor. Thank it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you.